So, so, so for those of you that are doing high performance workloads, uh, whoa, the aspect's a bit off, but we'll live with it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, my name is Mark Baker. I, uh, I'm part of Canonical. I work on the product team there with a special interest in OpenStack. Vincent? Uh, my name is Vincent. I'm six with TU, and I work a lot on packet processing. Good. So, um, given we're a little behind, we'll have to go fairly quickly. So, uh, please bear with us. But afterwards, please come and ask questions um, if we wish. So, um, in terms of the layers we need to operate and optimize, so hardware, of course. And um, uh, I'll show you in a minute how we engage with hardware. But optimizing the hardware from different types of vendors uh, in terms of taking advantage of uh, particular accelerator technologies, particular hardware features that are in there. There are, of course, the platform. Now, here we're talking largely in an open stack sense, but other platforms exist. You can, uh, as if you were here in the last session, you saw Kubernetes the canonical distribution of Kubernetes running on top of an OpenStack environment. You can also run that natively on bare metal. And of course, we have canonical OpenStack, um, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, OpenStack platform out there today. Uh, as you probably know, around 55% of production uh, OpenStack is on Ubuntu. 65% uh, of large OpenStack uh, is on Ubuntu. So we have the platform to optimize. And then we have the applications, right? Those can be VNFs, it could be data analytics, it could be more traditional style applications. But these are the layers that we need to engage with. Um, uh, how we deal with that, the first is we use a technology called MAS. It's an extremely popular product. This is a bare metal provisioning product that maintains an asset inventory, and I'll go into some more detail about that. But maintains asset inventory of the capabilities of all of your hardware, the features and functions that it is capable of, IP address management, some other pieces. Right? But once we have that asset inventory and we have the hardware being managed and controlled by MAS, then we are able to do some smart things via the API. Give me a machine that has particular capability, right, that matches my workload. Within, uh, of course, the, um, the, the platform, uh, we have areas there. And then we use a tool called Juju. Juju is a modeling tool that allows us to be able to model complex applications. Software applications, as we call them, so OpenStack or Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, lots of different other applications that we model. Right? Through tight coupling, we'll show how MAS interacts with Juju to be able to provide machine resources, in this case physical machine resources, with the capabilities um, that we have tagged within our bare metal environment. And then, of course, we have the application environments themselves. Now, if you're a VNF vendor or if you're an application vendor, then really optimization of that is up to you, but you um, will need to optimize for a particular, uh, you'll need to optimize for a general cloud environment, whether it's an OpenStack environment or whether it's a, uh, a container environment. Right? And we, we feel very strongly, actually, that the platform should remain the same, remain consistent optimization, of course, we can optimize, but we don't want to be optimizing lower down the stack for particular um, uh, VNFs, as otherwise we're still building um, areas of, of isolation. So, and then we have the three core primitives. So the things that OpenStack is very good at, other platforms are very good at, uh, is, is providing compute, storage, and network resources, right? And so um, we look at those areas, how do we optimize them? And again, not necessarily optimizing for very specific application or VNF, but how do we optimize to ensure that we're getting very fast storage, very fast network throughput, uh, and really being able to take advantage of the compute horsepower that exists in the hardware, you know, perhaps by removing layers that induce, uh, introduce latency um, or, or, or p uh, performance problems. So one of the ways that we try and address, that we address this performance is through giving you architectural flexibility. So there, is, there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all architecture for your environment, because your environment is your environment, right? And it has its own characteristics, its own network characteristics. It'll have uh, its own data center characteristics. And of course, your environment, your management tools, other bits that will have their own, their own properties. And so we, at Canonical, we provide you with full architectural flexibility. Um, via the tooling, and again, I'll show you this in a second, via the tooling, um, you're able to be able to architect place services. Architecture is all about placing services, choosing where you place services on the available resources you have. But we can architect that, deploy it, do some measurement, do some testing, move services, re-architect those, place them in different areas, redeploy, and we can do all of that within minutes. 
Now, whilst this isn't um, uh, a sort of scientific paper level of optimization, it's the optimization actually that people do in the real world every day is by trying it in, 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 in one way, re-architecting, trying it in a different way, measuring the deltas, right? And I'm sure all of you do this on a daily basis in terms of your testing. And that's, it's key for us to make that super easy for you to be able to do. Try it one way, try it another way, measure the difference, understand how an architecture is going to work in your environment. But we also come with opinions, right? So we have worked Canonical, we work with some of the biggest customers that are running OpenStack today, in fact, the biggest customers that are running OpenStack today, the people like Walmart, the people like Deutsche Telekom, uh, the people like Box. And um, from the, working with those people, we get a lot of input, a lot of experience as to Okay, what is, a, uh, what is a sane, what is a good architecture? What's it going to provide us with availability and performance? And so we can, um, uh, uh, we've taken a lot of that knowledge, a lot of that experience, encapsulated it into a tool called the autopilot that will deploy, manage, scale, and operate your cloud in a very real way, right? And do that to a, to a, a reference architecture. That reference architecture is fully converged but the important thing for you is that it's not a white paper level architecture. It's not a, uh, a, a thing that you know, we're handing out down in the booth. It's actually encapsulated in code, right? Because that's where architecture software lives and breathes. So we talk very quickly about MAS. MAS is a metal as a service. And the reason that this is important, because um, to be able to take advantage of bare metal performance, you have to understand what you have, and you have to have a means of making that easily available. So MAS Metal as a Service is an extremely popular tool used by um, a great many different customers. As I've already said, Walmart and uh, um, Best Buy, Sky, who you saw on stage, for example, on Tuesday, running all sorts of infrastructure, not just OpenStack infrastructure, all sorts of infrastructure uh, using MAS. It's bare metal provisioning, dynamic allocation of workloads. It has very sophisticated IP address management. So if you're... If you're, if you're IP address management is a problem for, for most people. There's no requirement for a separate tool. And the, the key piece here is really um, the MAS is not an Ubuntu-only tool. So whilst I'm stood here with an Ubuntu shirt on, running on an Ubuntu laptop, you're all wearing Ubuntu lanyards, right? But we know that there's a lot of CentOS out there. There's a lot of Windows. There's a lot of other uh, operating systems. And so uh, MAS, as a general purpose tool, allows us to be able to manage that hardware inventory and support it with many different environments. Um, like many of you have probably put these things together using Pixie Boot and TFT Boot and other services, um, MAS will allow us to be able to um, commission hardware, maintain an inventory of that, and then allocate workloads to it, bring up an operating system, allocate workloads to it. I'll, in the interest of time, show you that very, very quickly. So let's get rid of my email. There we go. Um, so here's a MAS system. Uh, it's, uh, um, it contains a number of nodes. So you'll see these uh, listed down here. Some of them are allocated. Some of them allocated. If I go and sh show you just any one of these, cross my fingers that we're still connected to the network. Yes, we are. So you'll see that we have some machine information here um, uh, about the cluster name, MAS is able to break things into a, uh, a region and a cluster so we can have, provide redundancy and start to uh, map our physical resources into our cloud resources very, very effectively. You see, we get a, a lot of basic information. But if we then scroll down, you'll see about network interfaces, uh, different events that have been associated with that. And as I scroll down further and further and further, you'll see here um, some of the commissioning information. So information that we have started to um, uh, uh, flush out during that build time. If you see, uh, uh, and that is what allows us to be able to create, um, to see what type of NIC this machine involves. How much memory does it have? What type of CPU does it have? Is the NIC capable of SIR, SRIOV, for example, or some of those network accelerated technologies, right, which Vincent will come on and talk about in a second. Um, so, very simply, it allows us to be able to, say, commission, manage this hardware inventory, and uh, actually the piece I was just about to show you there and came back off was um, tag them. So, here it's a relatively simple tagging. You'll see that we've got tags about um, uh, 
which sort of installer to use, whether it's a virtual resource or whether it's actually a, a real physical resource. And uh, likewise, we could tag it with SRIOV compa uh, capable, DPDK capable, for example. Um, if I want to bring one of these systems up, you'll see that some of them are deployed, some of them are allocated already. If I want to go and bring one of these up, very, very simply, um, I can take an action here, go and um, deploy. It'll ask me some questions. I'll put Ubuntu 16.04 on. It's the most current version of, a, uh, um, of certainly of our LTS edition of uh, Ubuntu, release of Ubuntu. Uh, contains a lot of those technologies that you, you will want in high performance environments. Go and deploy that, and off it will go. So maintaining this inventory of hardware, understanding what we have, and then making that available to a higher level tool to start to um, uh, be able to model these complex applications is the, really the first step on optimizing for performance. Um, so Maz there essentially is waiting for instruction. It's waiting for instruction from a higher level tool. That could be Juju for modeling and service orchestration, but it could also be other tools. So uh, uh, you could use Chef, for example, or go directly in via the interface that we just saw. Problem number two, if we move higher in the stack, is modeling big software. What do I mean by big software? Well, OpenStack is a great example of big software. Right? It is very many different components, six core components, but then a great many other components that sit, uh, many of which not ready and we wouldn't necessarily recommend for production, but some of which uh, may be interesting to you. So, um, but the way that you connect, deploy, connect those, it's too big for using sort of traditional package management. It's too complex. And what we need is a system that allows us to be able to model it, not just the deployment of it, but the modeling, the operations, and the connection of those things. Uh, we have Juju. In the last session, you will have seen some of that. Um, this represents a service model of how, what OpenStack looks like. Um, and if I, uh, how are we doing? Um, if I look through that, we've got a number of the different services, Keystone, Nova, Horizon, et cetera. And the relationships between them are all defined in something that we call a charm. So when we want to deploy an OpenStack environment and manage an OpenStack environment, we will put this either onto the canvas in the GUI environment that we have right now or via a command line, or if we wish, via an API, and say, go and deploy to this endpoint. An endpoint, in this case, would be uh, MAS, our physical environment that maintains that asset inventory. But if I um, uh, dip out, you know, the best way is to go and, uh, uh, is to go and show you these things. So uh, if I go into here, let's go into uh, OpenStack. You'll see we've got OpenStack bundles. It's a collection of services that have the relationships between those services predefined. I'll go and choose one of those, add it to my canvas, and commit. Boom, boom, boom. And deploy. Now, because of the interest in, of time, I'm not doing this for real now. I'm going on to the backup system. So, uh, uh, so you can see that it's um, uh, off we go. Boom, boom. And if I will zoom out, this is the here's one I prepared earlier kind of moment in the demo. Um, you'll see that this is what our OpenStack environment looks like. Now, if I go and drill into Neutron, for example, I can go and see we've only got one instance of, of new, uh, not Neutron, Nova running right now, our Nova hosts. I can want to go and scale that up. I can add two units very, very simply, confirm to add more Nova compute. It's able to do that very simply because we have a model, right? We have a model that can manage these systems. But you'll see on one level, it's a service model. On this level, we have that physical view which services are mapping to which machines. This is what allows us to be able to rejig the architecture and test if we wish. But you'll see that it's also giving us information about the machines that's coming up from our MAS environment so that we know which, how much memory they have, the number of cores they have, the number of CPUs they have, the type of disk that they have. So this allows me, in, in this case, I'm just scaling up very, very simply. But if I wish to, via the use of a constraint, I can say, bring up a Nova compute host that has X amount of memory and is SRIOV uh, capable. Right? Because we maintain that as inventory, because we have the connections between those systems. And this is what allows us to, to be able to do that and take advantage. 
So we're not necessarily optimizing at a code level and tweaking, right, which some people may advocate to do, but what we're doing is, is making it extremely easy for you to be able to take advantage of the horsepower that's there right, in a very automated, modeled way. Let me uh, uh, flip back. I want to make sure that uh, uh, Vincent gets his time uh, to, to talk through the great technology that he has. So Juju, um, in this case, we're modeling applications. We look at the higher level. How do we then we deploy applications into our OpenStack environment into, or even public cloud or containers? Right. Whilst we, we're talking primarily about OpenStack here, um, we can uh, do this in other ways. And so we're working with a ma great many of the VNF vendors, people like Affirmed, people like uh, Metaswitch, Expito, Huawei, uh, Ericsson, Nokia, for example, to enable their technologies to be deployed, managed, and scaled across these platforms in exactly the same way. Right? And again, we're working with them. We have something called VPIL, our uh, VNF Performance and Interoperability Lab, where we work with them to test and optimize their applications for a general OpenStack cloud, a general purpose OpenStack cloud. Right? That wouldn't necessarily look exactly the same as it would in your environment. It gives you a nice benchmark, gives you a nice way to be able to compare. Um, because when you get in your environment, you're going to want to deploy, re uh, test, re-architect, redeploy, and test. Right? to start to understand how the performance characteristics come through. The final piece, um, actually it's not quite the final piece before I hand over to Vincent, is that um, one of the key parts of this is that not only are we managing the, um, the, the deployment of that and managing the relations, the connections between the services, but we're also managing the operations. And so uh, a, a very simple action here, a uh, simple example here is a set of actions that we have on an OpenStack service. In this case, it's the Horizon dashboard. But the things that we want to be able to do, upgrade, for example, or pause whilst we perform some maintenance on the box and then resume, those things that we can do in very automated ways right, through a set of actions. Now, the interesting part here is that the actions are not defined by us. Yes we start some of the work on that. But a lot of the input that we get on the best way to perform these operations comes from our customers. So we have had people like Walmart and Deutsche Telekom and Best Buy and others and Sky feeding into this process. This is how they best um, start these processes. So compute, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, Mark uh, covered it in the, in the last session. But really, LexD is a container hypervisor. It's a way of being able to manage machine containers. This is a container that looks just like a VM, full Linux environment, um, uh, not a process container like a Docker container, which is very, very sort of dedicated to one particular task. Um, we have this. We've seen great traction with this uh, to be able to run containerized machine workloads. It's super fast. Uh, we're seeing super fast start time. It's 15 times the density, so much, far, uh, much greater density and therefore efficiency for you operating them. Uh, we have me numerous, numerous different ways to be able to interact with that with our uh, REST API via uh, uh, the OpenStack Nova scheduler, for example. Um, what's happened with the build there? Um, it's fully integrated into OpenStack. So if you're here in the last session, you will have seen um, Mark Shuttleworth and James Page deploying uh, workloads into a running OpenStack that are using LexD as a hypervisor in exactly the same way as KVM. So it's just representing a machine, but instead of a KVM machine, it's pulling a container, a full machine container. The benefits of that, of course, are that you are getting much better raw performance. And again, if you were in the last session, you will have seen that the raw performance is within the margin of error of measurement between running natively on the bare metal and running within the container. Why? Because the container is effectively the bare metal. And so without the overhead, all of the things that we've worked with carriers, for example, that want to do, let's start squirreling away in LibVirt and QMU and OVS to start to try and optimize to the nth degree on, you know, on a single machine bespoke tuning, right? Those things we do not have to do in the container, right? Because we have the kernel that is able to manage it much more effectively. Um, we're able, also able to do that um, uh, to provide 
full machine containers that are exclusive on a single machine. Right? So if you have raw performance on that compute level, it's super important to you. Um, we can do that. Ironic is one way of doing it. We don't think that's a re uh, particularly effective way. A much more efficient way is to use the exact same framework that you have with Nova today, that's deploying machine is by de deploying KVM containers, but to do it with machine containers via integration with LexD. And we have a lot of data, uh, various different workloads that we can provide to you just shows why that is the case. So the final piece, optimizing storage, very, very quickly. Bcache. Has anyone heard of Bcache? Yes, good. So Bcache is a way of being able to put a, an SSD or NVMe front end in, um, in front of traditional rotary spinning disks to act as a cache. So when I do write, perform a write operation, it goes into the SSD, it goes super fast, and then there's a write back into the, the traditional spinning disk on the back end. And likewise, if I'm, if I'm doing reads, right? So the benefit of this, it allows me to be able to get SSD performance across my entire storage, whilst only a proportion of my storage is actually SSD. Who's, is anyone using that? Gentlemen that were nodding in the middle, are you using that? Not yet? Okay. Well, certainly our experience, and a lot of the testing that we have done, one of the reasons that James Page, who was on stage yesterday on the interrupt challenge, was the quickest to be able to install, as he says it wasn't a race, but we came first, um, was because they were using this exact architecture. A lot of SSD, um, Bcache, front end on top of traditional spinning disk. With that, I'm going to hand over to um, Vincent and let him run through. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. So maybe let me. Okay, I need to get you to, to your mouse. Okay. So first, so first, thank you. So um, you introduced the topic. You say we need to optimize networking performance. So just wondering, the room so is. Uh, Trying to run at uh, 10 gig in the, in the data centers or more. Okay, so that's what we're going to, to, to check. I mean, is let's let's move on. So unfortunately, uh, we're not able to use this nice orange box for the demo today because we we want to use some XIAs to use a lot, some EV system to, to do a lot of um, lot of benchmarking. So what I'm going to 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 sh to to, um, to show you. What you Okay, thank you. Is first to demonstrate how to deploy um, an acceleration of the vSwitch that you have in an OpenStack environment in an easy way using a uh, charm environment. So why uh, we had to use it is that still a year ago when a, a customers, a, a partners were trying to, to do benchmarking, I mean they were spending weeks until they could push packets from the XR because OpenStack installation was complex because some DPDK dependencies, I mean, it was just a nightmare. So, so there was two problems to build solve. So the first problem was uh, OpenStack, so uh, Kali Nicole uh, is solving it now pretty well. And the second problem was to get as efficiently the virtual switch injected into the system. Then I'm going to show you how we boost the performance of Linux, and I will talk a bit more about that uh, when I come back on this topic. And then let's see so, some numbers out of the, out of the X years. So we are going to use a, a simple topology. We'll start with a, a mass server that uh, Mark has introduced. We'll have um, an OpenStack uh, Nova controllers and, and two compute nodes, uh, all interconnected with uh, two 10 gig, uh, 10 gig interfaces. So it's a pure OpenStack, typical from a Navy environment. Even if I don't pitch it too much, um, out of um, NAV because it, it can apply to, uh, um, to some cloud, enterprise cloud, private clouds, anyone that needs low latencies for high uh, transactions uh, applications. So first we, we set up our um, local uh, cloud. In that case, it was in, in Sixwin six Labs. So if you have been used with, with, with Juju, so then yeah, you get our credential. So if you, if you cut it and you get to Sixwin Labs, you'll be able to, to connect. Then we're going to, to, to bootstrap uh, and to, to deploy the, the OpenStack uh, environments in a, in, in a, in a few, uh, few minutes. So uh, as, uh, maybe you can come in, by the way, Mark, feel free. You, you, you sure, know. yes, absolutely. So what, it, what um, 
Well, Vincent is showing us right now is a, the process of, of deploying an OpenStack cloud. So uh, we have the model defined. It's uh, our standard reference bundle, uh, something called um, the OpenStack bundle uh, that we are deploying. And so he'll go through at actually talking to real hardware. It's talking to Maz exactly as he said. It commissions that hardware, brings it up, uh, and then we'll take the model and lay that down onto the hardware. So it'll go through that process. It's accelerated here as it, as it normally takes a few minutes. Yeah, so. So, uh, Unless we all get a coffee and we come back, but uh, I don't Indeed. know what's a machine coffee. I, I saw a gentleman there. I was asking, can we increase the font size? Uh, unfortunately, we ah. can't because it's not a real terminal. So it's yes, a video. Um, We'd have I feel to bad for so. that. So okay, it is is uh, the, the bundle. So now, as you can see, we're, we're going to load the Xenio environments on the on the on the systems, and uh, and we're going to 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 to, to run a watch. So. So here we are, we are doing we introduce status every every second. So you see a live environment but accelerated. So no time to, to go for the coffee right now, and uh, which means that um, in a, in a few minutes you'll see that all the nodes will get ready with their novas and neutrons, uh, and all will will become um, will will become active. So. Um, that's that's running right. That was running in fact in uh, in the in the server that has been introduced uh, previously, and. Once it will be done, on that bundle, you'll see I will try to, to add some, um, some uh, NFV accelerations. So we are almost done. So now we are done. So now it's, it's the next step. So I could have included in the previous bundle, but I really wanted to show that it can be uh, two independent steps, and incremental steps, because um, sometimes some people say, okay, they want to, to deploy their system, they want to, to try it, to, to, to feel the performance, and then they want to, to, to feel the benefits of uh, adding some, some acceleration. So as the, as the next steps, we are going to, to add uh, from the Charm store. So if you, if you, if you go on the Juju Charms, um, mm -hmm. you, you look for virtual accelerators, you, 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 you'll get these, um, these charms, so you, you, you are free to, to, to try it. So we're going to, to deploy it on the, on the environment that you, you, you saw on the previously. So since virtual accelerators need to get the packets out of the, the, the QEMU KVM uh, via Tayo, we don't want this packet to go through the Linux kernel. And then we want to send this packet uh, straight to the physical NIC. So we are going to, to, to be in between the Nova and the Neutron. So that's why we, we had some, some relations of this virtual accelerator with Nova. So when Nova will bootstrap uh, the, the QMU uh, backend VIOST, we will plug the VIOST user that you may be familiar with, with DPDK. And when we uh, then we'll process the packet, so anything that Neutron will commission, will, will configure, uh, we, we'll, uh, like Linux bridges, OV, some uh, OVS settings, some uh, uh, boundings, we, we, we'll try, we'll, uh, we'll offload it. So same, so it's going to be quicker because we just have to, to deploy uh, the virtual accelerators on the, on the compute node. So OpenStack is already set, so as you, as you can see it's here. So the, the virtual accelerators is going to be, to be deployed. So now it's almost uh, real time, it's not an accelerated uh, video. And now we, we are. So since it's Juju and uh, everyone likes to see the Juju GUI, <laughs> which is pretty nice by the way. So here we are. So, as you can see, we get this virtual accelerator inserted right in between uh, the, uh, Nova, uh, the Nova and the, the Neutrons. I just want to, to, to underscore what has happened here. So um, Vincent has deployed an OpenStack environment, and then via a single command has added in the six-wind accelerator technologies. Right? And because all of the integration that's required you know, between Neutron, between OpenStack, and the six wind technology is defined and encapsulated in the charm, it's just that single command. And that's how the icon that you'll see there on the right, the six wind technology, has, has arrived into our OpenStack environment. There hasn't required any consulting, it hasn't required any experts in either OpenStack or six wind to be able to add this in. It's just part of the model. So we, in the, we have ever tried to, to deploy some DPDK application in the host, I mean, the OVS, BDK, or some, some others which are, yeah, I mean, so maybe not that many. So because yesterday, I mean, every, every time get some question. Oh, I remember there was a presentation from a gentleman ye ye yesterday, and right after the presentation, the first question was, "How did you make it work?" <laughs> so here, as you see, as you introduce Mark, it was just uh, thanks to the charming. In fact, it it works way, way, uh, right away. So of course, then you you can play with with different tunings, uh, settings of um, of, uh, of of the services that that is being deployed. 
Okay, so once we, 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 we are done, so now nice things. This is the second step about the, the six wind technology. It's not like any DPDK applications. So we at six wind, we strongly believe that uh, the Linux networking data model is very important. We want to use IP tables. We want to use OVS VCTL. We want to use BRCTL. We want to use ETH tool. We want to use IP root two. So this data model for networking is key. I mean, we don't want you to learn yet another CLI, yet another shell. I mean, as you know, on a Linux and some Linux environments, you can use um, some Python to manage your networking, and exactly that's what uh, Neutron is doing. I mean, through some Python's uh, very uh, sophisticated logics, you can configure networking with some uh, VXLAN overlay, GI overlay, with some security groups. You can use some Calico logic if you want some layer three uh, models. You can uh, use different SDN logic, and so you can use OpenDLive, which is uh, some Java that will configure the, the networking on Linux. So it's already there. So why should we have some complexity? So let's let's keep Linux. So Let's, so I hope the display, ah. so I hope you will trust me if you see the number 25 here, which is ETH4. It's a net device, so which means on that net device, uh, uh, and it's a net device, which in fact has been stolen by DPDK, but it's still available when you, I do an IP link show, which means I could do IP-S link show, I will see this statistic. If we scroll down, you see on line 42, there's a net device tap, because I've already spawned a virtual machine. And that type interface, in fact, is a VOS user. And I still see that from my IP link show, which means same. I can uh, run, for instance, uh, a SNMP, and I can see the interface MIB on, uh, on it. I can still benefit of some Linux uh, net uh, namespaces. So everything is uh, just like it would be in Linux. But then you'll see uh, now that using ETH tool, it's not like any net device. ETH tool is telling me now it's a DPDK net device. So that's the case for the this is ETH4. That will be the case for the tap interface. So other things that sometimes you have to do depending on the, the workload you have in data centers. So if it's very low latency, you don't want to have any of the TCP uh, off, um, offloads. You want to disable all the LRO, TSOs, because it, sometimes it can add some, some overhead in your latencies. Sometimes you want to, to have them. So if you want to check what the NIC can do, what you do on Linux, use ETH tool dash K. Every time you do it. Here you have it. We, as I said, we have a net device. It behaves just like Linux. So you, you can use your ETH tool dash K to, to turn on, turn off so, so, the, the different hardware offload for, from your NIC. So same, of course, on the, ta on the tab device. The, another thing that uh, I did capture uh, here is, have you ever tried to debug your open stack like that? <laughs> it doesn't work. Unfortunately, as soon as you start a DPDK and FVI, that's what's happened. If you ever try to debug your SSH, why can't I do my first SSH to my VM? You do that because you, 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 you don't have any device anymore. You cannot run TCP up on your interfaces. So it's. For, for people which are, let's say, used to run uh, in, in an open stack environment uh, out of uh, Linux, it's, for you it's obvious. Uh, for many people, it is not. So here we are going to, to, to see t 10 packets from, uh, from the Xia, Proto 661, and running on these ETH4 interfaces. As I showed previously from ETH tool, this interface has, is under the hood a DPDK interfaces, but still managed through the Linux data model. Okay, now let's let's move on with um, with some some few uh, benchmarks. So remember, so I had two computers. So we're going to use in a case uh, some uh, benchmarks through the OV, through the uh, OVS. So we ca uh, we can use as an OVS some Linux bridge. So it doesn't really matter. In fact, the performance is about the same uh, since we we have this VXLAN framework and VXLAN is very costly at the Linux level. Then we're going to do the same benchmark but accelerated by virtual accelerators. And you, you'll see the, uh, the numbers and the, the latency for, for, for both cases. And we'll monitor uh, the workload using, uh, using Grafana. So ab about the, um, the, sw the swap boots. So 
in, in that case, so now we start with the first uh, case where we push um, a packet from the XCRs to uh, VNF. So in for that VNF, it has been uh, uh, another 16 product, which is a, a, a virtual router, a turbo router. And you'll see here that the maximum that we can get uh, out of this VNF, which is, by the way, running another DPK application in 5 gig, which is very frustrated. Um, and if you see the Linux CPU usage, I have four cores which are busy on the host side to keep pushing 5 gig uh, out to, to see the VNF. So, no way. I mean, it's not optimal. I mean, you cannot deploy at that for uh, some telecom applications. So now let's, okay, we, we, uh, we, 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 go, we jump to the compute that runs um, the virtual accelerators. We didn't change anything on the tone. I mean, exactly the same networking, same VXLAN overlay. And then we get to 20 gig. In fact, we, have, we, are, we are full line-wide because we don't have more port on this setup. And if you look on the CPU usage from Linux, we are 100% busy on one single core. That's because of DPDK. That's it. And we are good, 20 gigs. So now, let's check what does it mean for the latency. So why does latency matter? Is that, I mean, when you, of course, for transaction, for database, things like that, but for, in, in telecom, it matters because uh, when we do some uh, phone, uh, they are, the latency and the, is, is very, very critical. So here we are pushing traffic through this uh, Linux uh, virtual switch and the same traffic through the virtual accelerator. So as you, as you can see, uh, the, the mean latency for the previous case is about 112 um, microseconds. In our case, without changing anything, still VXLAN, we are at 9 microseconds. So, which, which is, means a lot of improvement in the latency, uh, which is very important for, for the VNF. So that's typically the, the kind of uh, key message that I wanted to, to bring you, that you don't need to break your neutron networking model. Keep it as it is. It's very important. Just add some acceleration. It, some people are thinking, like, hardware acceleration only, mm, but hardware acceleration, like SIOV, brings some complexity. You lose uh, uh, security groups, you lose your IP table, you, you lose um, sometimes li live migrations. Now, we can, we can keep a software modeling for packet processing, but at the same time, keep it as a Linux. I mean, keep in mind that OVS, Linux, which IP tables are Linux things. So we don't want that to lose the Linux story. And DPDK is not here to kill Linux. It's here to accelerate some Linux applications. So that's what we do with the virtual accelerators uh, from, from Sixwin. So thanks. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. So, and thank you all. I know we've run over. And so I appreciate you, you staying here and, and sacrificing some of your, uh, your coffee time. Um, we will make this video available. Obviously, the video of the session will be available. The, the video of, of the Sixwin demonstration, the integration uh, of the virtual accelerator technology with Ubuntu OpenStack uh, through Juju, will make that available uh, to you, and, and, and uh, uh, so you can view it in your own time. I appreciate it. It may have been hard to see. Um, does anyone have any questions? Quickly. No. Everyone needs coffee. So thank you very much, and um, uh, we will look forward to seeing you. Later.